Welcome to Eagle Eyed, I'm Bill Baker. This is part two of my interview with Christian Osberg. In part one earlier this week, we talked about his rise from Texas high school rugby to French pro rugby with the club Oriac. This episode, Christian explains in great detail how his downfall with Oriac started with a nasty leg injury that nearly ended his career, and his move back to the States for a fresh restart with MLR's Austin Gilbronis. Hope you enjoy. So you know it's strange with the injury, obviously you had the nasty jaw injury at life, you were injured in Italy. Yeah. Uh, let's talk about your hamstring. Oh yeah, so those first two years, I mean, I was playing consistently, uh, I was getting looked at with the US, you know, I was those first two years, I was like, this is the greatest decision I've made. And then in, the injuries kind of kicked in. And that third year, we ended up getting a new coach. Uh, he said some th rules with the president where he had to make sure he played GIF players, which GIF yeah. players over in France are just the French eligible players, the right. French players, pretty much. And I was working my way up to that. I was trying to get that through playing with the academies and stuff to try and get my GIF eligibility. I had one more, like, this is my final year and I was going to get it. And he's like, can't play you for the longest time. Uh, so unless we get injuries, something like that, you're not really going to play. So that third year, that's why he didn't really see much of me at all. Right. Uh, you then get, we had a couple injuries and I went from not playing at all to starting. And he was just like, you're going to start. We don't have any other option. You've been doing really well in practice too. So let's see how it goes. And we played in our bone. I remember this it was just a week before Christmas, uh, 2017. And it was 10 minutes into the match. We rushed up on defense. I made a tackle and then was trying to drop back. Uh, another guy just made another tackle and I was just next to it. So I thought I'd come around and kind of poach the ball, but I was kind of coming from behind and two people kind of come in and hit me. One person comes directly at me straight ahead. Another guy kind of comes from the side and it was a little wet. My leg slid out to the side where I almost did like a split. All the weight could kind of gets put down from the force when I hit down, when I go down, I'm in a split position and you see just it's stuck. And then when the snap happens, the, like my leg just kind of jolts forward. So yeah, I had snapped it snapped uh, my hamstring off the bone and also tore the muscle a little bit I had a small tear in the muscle the worst was the next day uh i had never been in that kind of pain before in my life okay. and i've got a pretty good high pain tolerance um i had to have a guy meet me and drive me to a pharmacy to meet up with a doctor to get me pain meds it took me like two hours to try and do i couldn't bend over and put shoes on i couldn't do anything but i get scans done and there's so much swelling and bleeding and everything going on in the scan you can't really tell what was wrong with it but all they could see directly was that i had a muscle tear huh. and they're like oh yeah six weeks should be fine six weeks go by they say oh we kind of missed up at the top there or something but it's too late now for a surgery so there's not much we can do but it looks like some of it's still attached so it could attach that was the thing i always said it it could it, maybe it could. attach yeah <laughs> i was like okay so they just said don't do anything just don't do anything with your legs and it might happen. So that reevaluation never happened six weeks later. So that's what January, beginning of February time. Fast forward to June, I'm getting another scan, and they're like, "Yeah, nothing's really attached yet. This season's done now, and this is me about to go home." And they're yeah. just like, "Yeah, go home, do whatever, come back. We'll see how it is. Come back home, come back." And they're like, "Yeah, nothing's still attached. You still can't do anything." And I was like, "What are you?" saying like what am i supposed to do here and while all this is going on i'm having uh the way my team was doing it because they're doing they were doing everything they could to try and save money was whenever you get injured in france you automatically get put on social security and the social security would normally they would go through the team and team would normally pay you but oriac the way they would do it is to save money and social security would pay you directly so you would come off of the payroll with oriac ah. so that when they would pay you they might pay you that small little chunk that Social Security didn't pay, but yeah, you they were just kind of saving money every way they could. Wow. I had an issue with Social Security. During that time from February to June, I wasn't getting paid at all either. Uh. You know, not only am I getting misdiagnosed and treated like crap, I'm also in a money dispute with them and it became a whole deal. And So come back to start preseason, and this is now, what is it, July 2018, and yeah. getting told all this stuff and that I should just tough it out and play and I'm like okay whatever you know we're playing the preseason matches and I get in a huge fight with the coach and like trainers and they're like the doctors are saying you can play 
like you have to play and i'm like why like i don't feel well enough they threaten contracted stuff and so i was forced to play in a preseason match and they're like how was that afterwards like how was that i was like well uh wasn't fun i mean like i I, Sorry, I, I don't mean so laugh. Weak. Jesus, no, I crazy. mean it was such a it was crazy. Like the whole thing was just a joke almost. And uh, I mean the only thing I felt confident with was the fact that my French started kicking in and I was getting confident on my French. I could scream at a guy in French about my leg and then I could scream <laughs> at a coach in English or someone and it was just I was letting everyone know that I didn't like what was going on. Got forced to play. Uh, they're like, Yeah, no, it's weak. That's normal. We're gonna just keep going from here. So I didn't play like a couple matches. They wanted to try and get the strength up of the strength I couldn't even build up because nothing was even attached. Like it was pointless. Then I became the guy where I was just playing 20 minutes off the bench. Uh. I mean, like that's all I could do before my leg would die out. The best way to describe it would be like you're running, you have like a dead leg, so you're barely moving your leg, but then you're also running with really heavy ankle weights or something Uh. on just one side. So you're just sort of dragging your leg. So every week it would be the same thing, arguments with trainers, doctors, coaches. And I would just tell them, I was like, look, there's nothing right about my leg. There's nothing right about it. They're like, what do you mean? You're able to play. You're able to do this. I was like, no, I'm not. Yeah. Like, I can only play 20 minutes. There's not, like, I can't do anything more than that. So I didn't really make excuses on the field, but I was really trying to get my voice heard off the field about everything. But nothing changed. And so you go from July 2018 to end of november 2018 and i'm playing almost every match for 20 minutes coming off the bench been doing everything without a hamstring uh, and finally got one of the doctors to be like look can i just show you my leg please can you physically touch and grab my leg now i mean it's been almost a year and i'm like okay and i flex my hamstring and at this point my hamstring had dropped to the middle of my leg and it was just a ball oh, in the middle God. of my leg and he was like, yeah, that's not right. Oh, he's like, I actually know. He's like, I know a hamstring specialist up in Paris, so I'd like you to go see him. And uh, the guy saw me and very quickly was just like, I don't know how you've been doing what you've been doing. Your hamstring's mush. Like, I don't know how this is even possible. Uh, he's like, I can definitely do the surgery for you, but, you know, you, you can decide on what you want to do. Because he was pretty much like, I don't think you'll be able to play rugby after this. And I let, the, I let the coaches and the team know when I came back. I was like, this is about to ruin my rugby career. They're like, like everyone's eyes started kind of opening up like, uh-oh, yeah, this isn't good. And when I came home for Christmas, I started going around all, pretty much all around Austin, everywhere, looking for people who might try and be able to help. And got lucky. I s- decided to throw my throw my hopes out to a doctor out of Dallas. I was like, this all kind of sounds similar to what this guy can help me with. And they were honestly like, we can't help, but this other doctor on the uh, part of the practice can. And it ended up being a, uh, the surgeon, the head surgeon and doctor for the Dallas Cowboys. And he was like, I can definitely do this, but I'm just worried about nerve damage. It's been so long. So I did a few tests. We stayed up in Dallas for a few days, did a few tests checking out my nerves. And he said there was a little bit of denervation and some nerves weren't really kicking in, but he believed that a lot of that was scar tissue. Honestly, the thing that saved me through all of this was the fact that I did stay active and the fact that I did keep doing everything I could to keep blood flowing. And I mean, I bought like those little muscle stimulators, like complex machines. Um, And every night I had a routine. Every day I would use it. And uh, every day I was doing what I could to keep active. And that actually saved me in the long run. Got the surgery just after a full year of it happening. Uh, went two months in a leg brace where I had to stay immobilized. And they're like, no, you're no weight bearing or anything like that. So anywhere I went, I took it to an extreme. They're like, you can, here's the crutches or whatever. And use that to move around. But I took it to an extreme where I went around on a wheelchair. Oh, like, geez. I'm not touching <laughs> at all. Little, so, little scooters. <laughs> yep. Yeah. So ended up seeing him. Maybe just before the the checkup time when he wanted to see me, like at two and a half months. I saw him just before that. I think I saw him right at the two month period. Um, and I was able to take my brace off and everything like that. And I walk in and he's like, I don't know what you've done the last few months or how you did it, but you've actually recovered a lot better than I was expecting. So you wow. can walk out of here if you want. Wow. So the wheelchair actually saved everything. I didn't I did everything I could not to get to stand up at all. 
then that's when the craziness happened because then I stuck around a little bit here for a few weeks to kind of got used to get used to walking. And then I went back to France and went to a big uh, rehab facility over there. And I would do that for a month and have like a month off. And then I went back for another month. And I mean, it was very intense. It was you live there for right. three weeks, a month, went back to Oriac and did like another month and a half of rehab. And with what was supposed to be a year till I came back, I was able to come back in six months. Ah, that's amazing. Determination, oh, man. That's, that's a yeah. real determination. And, and I mean, to now look back to, to I've gotten, I got the same thing Paul O'Connell did, getting the hamstring ripped off, and what he got into his career. Wow. And what I got, which should have ended my career, I'm able to keep playing. You eventually came back. You were, you were playing. I eventually came back, yeah. Yeah, played in a few handful of matches there at the end. And so that was the problem. And when I came back, uh, they were like, you were one of our best players, one of our best second rows, I mean, forwards-wise, uh, with one leg. Like, <laughs> I, I remember doing testing with one leg. I had, like, I mean, my vertical isn't that high, but I had, like, the highest verticals out of the forwards. And they're like, how are you doing this? I was still right. faster than a handful of guys without a hamstring. And so they're like, if you were able to do that on one leg, we can't wait to use you with two legs. I was like, sweet. Yeah. I come back, I'm allowed to start training again. And they were like, okay, just get over here. We're going to do fitness stuff with you, a little bit of touch, like a little bit of skill games, a little bit of touch, and we'll ease you back into it. So I was like, that makes sense. That's fine. But I did that for like a month and a half. And I was like, where's my opportunity? I was like, yeah. what's going on? And every time I got a chance to play, um, there was an injury that happened or I was thrown in last second. So I would only get a couple days worth of even training with the group. They would make excuses like, oh, you didn't look good. You didn't do this. You didn't do that. And I was like, what do you expect? Yeah. Like the whole mental side of the prep was out the door. The whole everything going into it was out the door. And you, you then going into a situation where we changed coaches three times in two years, head coaches, all internally. The last, you know, two and a half, three years I had there at the club went, it, it became very toxic and it became very tough to try and break out of some of their ways and some of their idealistics of what they wanted with the team. And it didn't help that you had a president who didn't know too much about what was going on. When he started hearing about the stuff I did know about how they were treating some of the players, you know, yeah, def- they were just trying to get me out. Yeah. And it wasn't healthy. It wasn't healthy for anybody because everyone's complaining about how things were going on and everyone's like, why are you not playing? All right. like, I literally don't know. I don't know. So, so the writing was on the wall for you. I mean, it's and, and yeah. in your mind is definitely time was the it was time to move on. Exactly, and I did, I knew if I would have stayed to the end of the season, it, my opportunity of doing anything was going to be too late. At the very end of February, I was talking with my agent, and I was just like, "Look, what do you think I should do? Because this isn't good with everything going on. I mean, they keep telling me in training to step it up. Mm-hmm. I need to do something to show them." And I was like, "I've done a month where every day." I am running my ass off. I'm running all over the place. I'm breaking away. I'm scoring tries. I'm setting people up. I'm everywhere on defense. I'm doing everything I can do. I'm stealing balls. I'm I'm making everything competitive throughout everything, and I'm still not playing. What do I do? You even had starters and Frenchies telling me, like, how are you not playing? What's going on? Right. You're you're making this hell for me in practice, and you're not playing. What's going on? So, yeah, speaking with my agent, and he was just like, let's look for something else. We got to do something else. Yeah. And I was like, "All right, let's let's do it. I'm in." And uh, I remember right when I said that, he goes, uh, "Well, there's a team in Russia that's in the Challenge Cup. I think they need a guy." <laughs> like, I don't really want to go to Russia. Wrong, wrong direction. <laughs> yeah, I, I was like, "It is end of February, and I oh, don't want to go to Russia." It's like that's not going to be fun. Uh, I was like, "Just for fun, let's see what's going on in Austin." And I got lucky where they had a guy over here in Austin who had just uh, gotten injured and they were thinking about contacting me. And uh, it ended up just working out. But then uh, about a week or so later, we had kind of finalized the deal with Austin for me to come back for the rest of the season. With, you know, maybe a week or so later, got out of my contract with Oriac. You know, we walked away. Everything was cool. Tried to do it very amicably. Good. I was able to get out and, and do it. With everything that had happened, it was on my terms, so that was kind of nice. So I remember I, I talked to you a while back then. Um, you, uh, I saw your your media posts of uh, you know your plane landing in Austin or whatever else, and yeah, it was still was good. Hush, doing, hush. It was still very hush hush. I was trying yeah. to be very subtle about it, and <laughs> um, 
you know, I mean, if you look back now, I did a post of flying into Austin. I made sure to put in uh, Coda, the stadium that we were oh. flying over by the airport on purpose. I was like, if people can figure this out, that'd be kind of cool. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I got over there and within that week was kind of crazy. You know, I was technically signed with Austin and uh, we were getting ready. We just come from beating Houston, you know, first win and, you know, so long. Right. And I was like, okay, coming into something good. And finally, a team that kind of wants me, and it's going to be a great opportunity. Uh, first few days, just handling medical stuff and paperwork stuff, and um, get a couple days worth in a training. And they were wanting to do a big interview and kind of glow up thing and big announcement about me coming back. You know, they're like, yeah, this is going to be great. Kind of going into our game with San Diego, this is going to be awesome. And the day they were going to announce it was the day pretty much the sports world shut down. And they're like, yeah, we're going to put this announcement on hold a little bit and just kind of play this one out. I was like, yeah, I totally get it. I understand. So then you get to the next week and the season's canceled. I was, it's been a weird time because until they announced me even being with the team, I haven't really been able to say anything. Right. So because they're like, because I'd only signed also for the end of the season. Then they said, you know, no matter what, we want to try and keep you. And I'd be like, cool. So this whole time we've been working on stuff and trying to get stuff sorted. And, and through all of this, they're like, unless someone asks you, we really don't want you to say anything because we still want to put out that video. Right. So it's been a weird, um, a weird five months or so where, you know, I'm happy that I was able that all this sort of happened. I was able to be home. But it's been, yeah, it's been tough. It's been tough. You seem to be in a better place in your family and, and um, yeah. you know, your home. Um, yeah. And MLR, which is up and going, it's 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 exciting to watch. It's very exciting. It almost got to a point where uh, it was like, if I don't hop on this quick, I might miss an opportunity because the amount of names and people coming into it, it's just intriguing for anybody. People from France, the English, you know, uh, guys from New Zealand, Aussies, all of them were like, I want to go. Yeah. And so the amount of people interested makes it to where it's like, okay, as an American and as someone in my position where – there's been a lot of ups and downs. If I don't get on this quick, I might miss an opportunity. You had your taste of, you know, U20s, um, you know, that, that level of international play. Are you still driven uh, to play for the USA, to get your first cap for the senior side? Um, you know, what is driving you now? What's next? Well, I, yeah, absolutely. I mean, if I wasn't doing all this for a high or just a goal like that, then what's kind of a point, really, right. you know? But I'm still young, and so I've done so much in such a short amount of time to have experienced so much and learned a lot of life lessons throughout all this. That's the main thing I can take out of this. No matter all the negatives and the ups and downs that I've had through all this, I try to look at all the positives that have sort of come out of it. And I've learned a lot and I've experienced a lot and um, trying to take advantage of this new opportunity because I'm looking at this as almost like another restart like that I had had, you know, six years ago. To get a restart like this uh, and be able to do it back home, be able to do it in a growing league, be able to do it with all this kind of positivity kind of coming out of the MLR is something and it's really cool. Uh, but I definitely have a lot of other goals and a lot of other things I want to do. You know, I'm really looking forward to this next opportunity to ton of, cause I know I'll be a different player than how I was in France. So it'll be cool. One heck of a journey you've had so far. And, and mm -hmm. I mean, I hope it keeps going, but, uh, Kirsten, thanks for joining me. It's been a lot Thank of fun you. talking to you, uh, catching up on your, your story. It's, it's been great. Yeah. Thank you so much for having me.